Hello, welcome. This is What's New and What We're Reading for Women's History Month. My name is Dana Munch and I am here with my colleague Nancy Moskowitz. We are both adult services librarians at New City Library. And today we're going to be talking about a collection of um, titles that sort of feature interesting, courageous, adventurous women. And we're really excited to talk about them today with you. Um, so as you may know, March is Women's History Month. To remind ourselves of the contributions of women throughout the years to our history and culture, we have this month that celebrates women. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued the first presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8th as National Women's History Week. The following year, Congress passed a resolution declaring a national celebration. And 42 years later, we are still celebrating it. Um, women's history is American history. Everything they've done contributes to the history of our country as much as anything done by men. And we are still fighting for gender equality even today. Um, lots of women throughout history have gone unknown. They've been ignored, forgotten, and overlooked and undervalued. Women's History Month is the perfect time to remember these women who were routinely denied opportunities that we take for granted today. We appreciate their incredible courage and perseverance in the face of overwhelming opposition, mostly from men who wanted to keep them in their place. Mm. Um, what is the quote? Well-behaved women rarely make history. So we are talking about all of those women today. Well, not all of them, a selection. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so as I just said, there are a lot of women, a lot of titles. Uh, you know, We could turn this into a multi-day webinar if we really wanted to. So we've tried to trim it down for you um, and I'm really excited to get it started. So I'm gonna pass it off to Nancy and we are going to start with our nonfiction titles. Okay, um, thanks, Dana. Uh, I'm very excited about this webinar too. And the more I did research for this, the more inspired I became by these women. Uh, the first book I want to talk about is The Doctor's Black Well, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Women to Medicine and Medicine to Women by Janice P. Namora. And I don't know how many of you have heard of these sisters, Drs. Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, the first and third female doctors in the United States. Elizabeth and Emily were immigrants from England. They came with their family when they were young. Their father believed that women should be educated as well as men. So they were lucky to have an enlightened parent. Uh, when Elizabeth finished school, she became a, a teacher. And she had no interest in science and she was okay with being a teacher, but she visited a sick friend on her, on her deathbed and the friend told her something that changed her life. She said, my agony would have been so much more bearable if I had had a female doctor. And this was the spark that changed Elizabeth's life. She decided even though she didn't like science and she was a little squeamish that she would become a doctor. Now, women were not doctors in the United States, so she had no path. So she did study with a sympathetic doctor for a few years, and then she applied to medical school, and surprise, she was accepted nowhere. But the Geneva Medical College in upstate New York decided they would let their students decide whether she could come, assuming that the students would say no. So they uh, had to have a unanimous decision, and the students, as a joke, accepted her into the program. When she got there, they, she was treated with a lot of ridicule, unkindness, uh, prejudice, but somehow she managed to finish school. It was a two-year program at the time, at the top of her class. She then went to Europe to further her studies. Now, when her younger sister, Emily, came along, Geneva Medical College said, no, we already had one. We're not doing this again. So she was not allowed to attend that school. She attended two other schools. And she also went to Europe to finish her studies. Both sisters um, came back, went to New York City, started the Women and Children's Infirmary in New York City, in Greenwich Village. And later on, they started a women's medical college, uh, which ended up educating over 300 female doctors. So to think today when seeing female doctors is so commonplace, to think of the struggle and the incredible obstacles they overcame to become doctors is just awe-inspiring. And I 
firmly and hardly recommend this book. It's written like a thriller because it's their their uh, exploits were so amazing and what they managed to accomplish. So put this on your list. It's a really great book. Okay, the next one is The Woman They Could Not Silence, The Shocking Story of a Woman Who Dared to Fight Back by Kate Moore. Uh, just as a side note, Kate Moore is the author of Radium Girls, another book I really enjoyed. I'm sure no one has ever heard of this, um, the, the subject of this book. Her name is Elizabeth Packard. And in 1860, she was a uh, minister's wife. She had six children and she was living a typical housewife's life. But then she became outspoken as to her feelings about religion. And she had the nerve to speak publicly how she disagreed with her husband on his take on religion. So there was a very uh, easy solution for her husband. If he could declare her crazy and get two doctors to sign off, she could be put in an asylum for the insane, which he did. And she entered the asylum in 1860. And when she was there, she found other women who shared her plight. They were put in the asylum because they were too outspoken. They weren't docile enough for their husbands. And while she was there, she had no idea when or if she would ever get back. It was not up to her. Um, she found that poorer women in locked in this asylum were treated with, with great um, cruelty and abuse. So she decided that if she ever got out, she would, she would advocate for the rights of women and the mentally ill. And spoiler alert, she did get out. And she spent the rest of her life advocating for the rights of women and the mentally ill. She wanted to make divorce easier for women. And the problem with divorce at the time was if you did get divorced, you lose your children automatically. So she tried to get that law changed. And she went to state by state by state to improve the uh, plight of women and the mentally ill. So uh, she's an unsung heroine for sure. Okay, the next is the Scarlet Sisters. Sex, Suffrage, and Scandal in the Gilded Age by Myra McPherson. Um, these women are not unknown to us. Uh, it's Victoria Claflin Woodhull and her sister, Tennessee Claflin. They were uh, born in extreme poverty, managed by hook and crook to bring themselves out of the poverty, ended up in New York City where they started the first women-owned brokerage firm in, in Wall Street. And they also were uh, the owners of the first women's weekly newspaper in the United States. But why people might know the names is that Victoria was the first woman to run for president of the United States in 1872. In 1868, when the 14th Amendment was passed, um, it was to give uh, the vote, right to vote, to formerly enslaved Black men. It specifically did not give the vote to formerly enslaved black women, but Victoria felt that it should apply to women. So she ran for president with Frederick Douglass as her running mate. And of course she didn't win. Um, but what was interesting, what came out of this is the Supreme Court said, definitely this amendment does not apply to women. And it shouldn't because women's highest mission is to be wives and mothers. Okay. All right, but uh, okay, next is Madam C.J. Walker, The Making of an American Icon by Erica L. Ball. You could see America's first self-made female millionaire was a black woman. Uh, nothing in, in Walker's life would have prepared her for her success. She was born in 1867 to formerly enslaved um, people in Louisiana. She was extremely poor, married at 14, widowed at 20, and through her own ingenuity, her grit, her determination, she started a, a hair care business. She sold it to women one-to-one, -one, and then she hired a sales force. And she, her, her company became extremely successful, and she ended up being a millionaire. When she died in 1919, she... Um, had a lavish estate in Westchester next to the Rockefellers, although something tells me they didn't uh, hobnob. But she's also a wonderful philanthropist. She left a lot of money for people, uh, scholarships for Black women, and she was a real inspiration. And how she did it, read, read the book. <laughs> okay. An Illuminated Life, Bella, Belle DaCosta Green's Journey from Prejudice to Privilege by Heidi Arizona. 
if anyone read the book, The Personal Librarian by Marie Benedict, that's the fictionalized account of Belle DaCosta Green because her life is so incredible. It sounds like it's made up. She was the first director of the J.P. Morgan Library. She was handpicked by J.P. Morgan to run his library. At the time, he was a millionaire and he was acquiring all kinds of uh, treasures, manuscripts, artwork, and he needed someone to do the buying for him. So she became the director of the library. Well, she was known as his personal librarian. Later on, she became the director. But she was able to educate herself, know what she should pay for something, if something was worthwhile, if they needed another Gutenberg Bible. And she was hobnobbing with um, the society and spending lots of money. And she was in charge of uh, a very important collection. But the thing that was so astonishing is that she was a black woman passing for white. When she moved from Washington DC to New York City with her family, her mother said, we're not gonna have any opportunities unless we pass for white. So they use, they put in the name Da Costa, which would account for their dark complexions because they had a supposed Portuguese grandmother. Um, if anyone had ever guessed that she was not white, she of course would have lost her job. She would have lost everything. And the sad thing is that she was such a talented, brilliant woman, and yet she had to live with this secret hanging over her life. And yet she managed to do a wonderful job. And we have a, a, the great collection of the J.P. Morgan Library to and thank her for that because she did it all. Okay. Um, the Double Life of Catherine Clark, The Untold Story of the Fearless Journalist Who Risked Her Life for Truth and Justice by Catherine Gregorio. Uh, this book is written by Catherine Clark's great niece, uh, Catherine Clark, who I had never heard of. And this book is forthcoming. It's not quite out yet. Uh, she was the first American female journalist to report from behind the Iron Curtain. She was uh, stationed in, in 1955. She was stationed in Yugoslavia and she befriended a high ranking official in the, in the Yugoslavian government. And he confided to her that he had a lot of doubts about the communist system, but he wasn't able to say anything because he would have been exterminated. So he would come over to her, her house. They would run the water just in case the uh, building was being, her apartment the, was being bugged. And he, and he dictated his memoir to her. His, and she, with great personal risk, she managed to smuggle it out and it was published and it gave the whole world, the first look at life behind the Iron Curtain. And had it not been for her, it would never have been known. So we have a, a great thank you to this very brave woman who opened up the Iron Curtain. Okay, the Sea Trilogy by Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson is considered the finest nature writer of the 20th century. And this new edition of her work, by, which came from uh, Library of America, is the Sea Trilogy, which contains her three books, Under the Sea Wind, The Sea Around Us, and The Edge of the Sea. And she writes exquisitely. She was an English major until she got uh, fascinated by biology. And after college, she worked for the Bureau of Fish and Wildlife, and she was sent to different parts of the world to report on conditions there. And possibly, or more likely, probably, that's what inspired her to write her other book, her well-known book, which is uh, Silent Spring, which came out in 1962. She saw the devastation that was caused by testing of bombs, pesticides, and all kinds of uh, chemicals that were destroying nature. And she was the first person to call a stop to this because at the time people thought we would just continue on the way we were, conquering nature. And unfortunately that attitude continues today, but she was the first one to get uh, to sound the alarm and she did manage to get a lot of pesticides banned because they were carcinogenic and harmful to life. Okay, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality by Tomika Brown Negan. Uh, this woman is a woman of first. She had so many accomplishments she was the first federal black female judge. She was the first woman to uh, run to be a representing, uh, be a New York state representative. She was the first black female to 
um, be president of the Manhattan City Council. And she was the first black woman to be on the uh, NAACP legal team during the civil rights era. She was also a great inspiration to many women who uh, have followed in her footsteps, such as Kamala Harris and uh, others who followed her. But she was probably never given as much credit as she should have been given because she was a woman, but she did amazing things. Okay. Okay, women's history, fiction. And, you know, there's so many women in fiction that are unforgettable that we enjoy, but I, I tried to pick some women um, who, are, who have a struggle against society. Some of them win and some of them don't, but we'll, we'll just take it from there. Okay, next. This is a contemporary book, His Only Wife by Peace Adzo Medi. This book takes place in Ghana. And the main character is a young woman named Afi who lives in a small village. Her mother pressures her to marry this man. She would be his only wife, which is a real coup. And uh, she very reluctantly agrees. He didn't come to the wedding. So after the wedding, she goes, moves into the city to this lavish apartment. She has everything she could ever want. She doesn't have to lift a finger. But her husband doesn't show up and she's getting quite an, annoyed by this. So he finally does drop by. And although he's not married to another woman, he's in love with another woman that he lives with. And she is his only wife, his only legal wife, but she has to compete. And he just doesn't want to give her more than he's giving of himself. So she takes his lavish um, allowance that he allows her and she opens up her own business because being a, a rich man's plaything is not for her. And she is one of the strongest and most inspiring characters I've read in fiction. She, she could have it easy, but she doesn't want it. She wants to fulfill herself. So I, I just highly recommend this book. It's just really entertaining. And, and it's nice to learn about another culture too. Okay, Daisy Miller by Henry James. I have here, poor silly Daisy. And I guess those are the words that come to mind when you think of Daisy Miller. This book was written um, in the 1880, 1878 actually. And it's a novella, it's short. So if you haven't read Henry James, you don't have to be intimidated by this book. Daisy Miller is a young, pretty girl from Schenectady, New York. She's on the grand tour with her mother and her little brother. And she's so innocent of society's rules and strictures that she just doesn't know she's supposed to follow them. So she pretty much does what she wants to do. And even though the narrator of the book, whose name is Winterborn, tries to warn her, Daisy, you shouldn't do this, you can't do that. She ignores it. She wants to do what she wants to do. She she's decides that she no one can tell her what to do. She's headstrong and foolish. And of course, her war against society means that she's shunned and gossiped about. And unfortunately, Daisy does not win her battle with society. And it's, uh, she is a tragic figure. Okay, next. <laughs> a Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. This is one of my favorite books growing up. I read it over and over and over, but I hadn't read it until recently as an adult. And as I read it as an adult, my perceptions of the book change. I still love Francie Nolan, the, the main character, but I had a lot of new respect for her mother who I thought, Francie doesn't really get along with her mother. She thinks her mother is, is kind of an old pill. Uh, she, mother works really hard to support the family because the father is a alcoholic, works occasionally. Uh, but the mother is the one that holds the family together. She wants to improve their lives. She has them read Shakespeare together. And I just found her on this reading to be uh, a really strong and admirable character. So if you haven't read it since you were a kid, pick it up again and, and see what you think. Okay, Honor by Thridi Umragar. And here's the question I pose. What is honor and why is it used as a justification for murder? Thridi Amargar is one of my favorite authors. She wrote The Space Between Us. And this book was just devastating. It's a story of two women. One is an American Indian uh, journalist who left India as a child, now lives in the United States. And she's assigned a story 
that takes place in a small village in India where this woman Mina has, she's a Hindu woman who's married a Muslim, which is a, considered a great scandal. And her and she and her husband are madly in love. They have a, a little child and her husband is set on fire and killed. And she is very badly disfigured and maimed because she tries to put the fire out. And so she has decided she wants to bring the perpetrators of this killing to justice. These people are her own two brothers who, who felt they were justified in killing this man. Uh, there is very little chance that they will be brought to justice, but Mina decides that she wants to at least try. And uh, I found this book just devastating uh, to think that honor is used as a justification for murder and people can get away with it. Unfortunately, it still happens um, in some parts of the world. So if you want to read something that's going to stay with you for a long, long time, I highly recommend this book. Okay. Sister Carrie by Theodore Dreiser. Uh, here's a woman who actually beats society. She's the first unrepentant fallen woman in American literature. I don't know that anybody reads Theodore Dreiser anymore. I suspect they don't. This book was published in 1900. Uh, Carrie, Ca Sister Carrie, Caroline Niebuhr, is a young, innocent farm girl who comes to the big city to live with her sister and to work in a factory. And she decides she hates working in the factory and this is not the life she wants. And she remembers she had met this uh, kind of seductive uh, roué on the train and she gets back in touch with him. And to make a long story short, she becomes this kept woman and she likes it. She doesn't have to work and she has everything she wants. She eventually trades out to a richer man and then eventually be actually becomes an actress. Now, the shocking thing about this book is that she is not punished for her act for her actions, the men are, they both end up in uh, unfortunate circumstances, but Theodore Dreiser doesn't punish Carrie. And I, and it, it may have seen, um, it was very shocking at the time because people who behaved in certain ways should be punished and she wasn't. So if you can find a copy of Sister Carrie on the shelf, and if you can't, we can always get it for you through into a library loan. Just take a look. He also wrote American Tragedy. He's a good author. Uh, the House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Um, Lily Bart, she's another tragic woman who is uh, bested by society. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, Lily Bart is a beautiful woman from a good family, but she has no money. And she's now 29. And her, her sell-by date is coming up soon. She must get married to someone wealthy. Her friends that she hobnobs with are very shallow. They're not nice people. And she has to spend her tiny amount of money that she does have to keep up with them, to get the clothes, to go to fashionable restaurants and, and, and to resorts. Um, she likes to play cards for money. She has a bit of a gambling problem. She loses all her money. And as she loses her money, she loses her friends. And she, lo she loses her place in society. She keeps falling down to the next tier, lower tier, lower tier, till she um, has nowhere else to go. The, the, the book is narrated by her friend Selden, who loves her, but she would never even consider marrying him because he doesn't have enough money uh, to keep her in the society. So it's unfortunate look at a woman who really doesn't have many choices in life except marriage. And when that doesn't work out, she's got nothing. Um, okay. Um, okay, Dana, you take it from here. <laughs> okay. So we would be remiss if we didn't talk about our own backyard, meaning Rockland. It may be small, but we've seen many women uh, come through this area that deserve to be acknowledged, and we are going to talk about them. Oops, I lost my notes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the first book that we're going to talk about is A Wondrous Journey, a small book with big life lessons by Martha McGuffey and Lynn Clewis Manzion. 
So Rockland's own Dr. Martha McGuffey was the first female reconstructive and plastic surgeon to graduate from Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1949. Uh, she was also the first woman surgeon to serve on the staff of a major suburban hospital, being Nyack Hospital. Uh, she is a mother of eight and a tireless advocate and humanitarian for African children and people afflicted with AIDS. Um, losing her two young sons to AIDS spurred her devotion to helping Kenyan children living with the same disease. She was the embodiment of one person making a big difference. Next is The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan. I'm sure you have heard of this book. Mm -hmm. This book uh, was first published in 1963, and it is arguably the book that um, ignited the women's movement, specifically the second wave feminism in the US. Um, it was a bestseller when it first came out and it is, has stood the test of time for people <laughs> wanting to learn about feminism in the US. Uh, she had been a brilliant scholar, but she had also become a Rockland County housewife, which she chafed at the severely limited role that she was given. Um, her research concluded that many women were thrust into these lives of chores and errands and home life that didn't necessarily satisfy or fulfill them and roles that they didn't necessarily choose for themselves, which is a big piece of feminism is having that choice. Finally, someone gave words to that malaise that many married women were feeling and those words incited a social upheaval that changed the way of the world um, and the way that women work and have choice. Next, we have Bomb and Gilead. Journey of a Healer by Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. Uh, Dr. Margaret Morgan Lawrence is known for many accomplishments, not the least of which was graduating from Columbia Med School in 1940. Uh, she was the only black student in her class and she became a respected pediatrician and child psychiatrist. She was also the first black psychoanalysis in the US. In 1949, she and her husband helped start a progressive racially integrated cooperative community called Skyview Acres where she lived for nearly 70 years. True to its principles, the community is still thriving today in the town of Ramapo. Dr. Lawrence died at 105. She faced incredible obstacles and cruel prejudice, but she achieved her dream of working with children and lived a very nice long life. Mm. <laughs> uh, Ladies Live, How Rockland Women Got the Vote by Isabel Keating Savelle. So the author was a well-respected journalist and historian who lived in Grandview for many years. Her subject, the Rockland women who worked tirelessly to attain suffrage for women include Carolyn Lexo Babcock who died in 1980 at age 98 wearing an ERA button. Uh, this Barnard graduate was also active in the Birth Control Federation of America and was a founding member of the Women's Peace Union. Song of David by Kathleen Lukens. Um, she was an, just an ordinary Rockland housewife until she had her son, David. Uh, David was diagnosed as autistic and there was simply no place for him to go. There was no camp, no school, just an institution, um, which seemed unacceptable and is unacceptable. So she started an organization for children like her son and Camp Venture was created. She worked tirelessly to impart dignity and worth to people who would have been warehoused or otherwise forgotten. And her efforts to give the most vulnerable, fulfilling lives to be part of a family and community have been a blessing for all of us. Um, and especially people who, um, you know, are diagnosed with autism. The Spy Who Wore Red by Aileen, Countess of Ramanobis. This glamorous Countess Spy was a Rockland County native, but she was born in Pearl River in 1923. At the age of 20, this beautiful model, Aileen Griffith, was recruited as a spy to uncover secrets of the Spanish nobility and their ties to the Nazis. Um, obviously, this is a very adventurous life and it thrilled <laughs> many when the first of her seven books came out. Um, so there's a lot about her life to be, to be read and, and uh, fulfill your adventurous desires, I guess. Um, and with that, we are going to wrap up. And these, this is a slide of all the books that we have talked about today. Um, let me check. Ooh, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> um, so I am going to 
leave this up for you. I will also, um, after this is over, send an email with this list to you if anyone is interested in it. And I am going to allow everyone um, the ability to talk if you want to, if you want to say something, have any questions, comments, concerns, want to add something, um, any of that, feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, our next what's new and what we're reading is going to be on April 1st. And for that meeting, for that meeting, it's going to be about uh, we're going to be very interested in what you're reading. It's going to be more of a book chat. We will have some recommendations about the things that we've been reading to start off with, um, but we're really hoping people bring things that they have read recently, are looking forward to, um, what you're reading right now, and we'll just have some great book-related conversation. Mm. And with that said, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, once again, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. And until then, happy reading. Yes, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Dana.